Welcome back to EASD TV. Now we've got a bit of competition from other events that are going on in the hall. So stick with us despite the noise that's going on. Now one of the things that's a feature of ESD is the announcement of trial results and some of them are particularly eagerly awaited and that is true of the Surmount 4 trial and with me are two people to talk us through it. So Navid uh, Sattar uh, from the University of Glasgow and Lou, uh, Lou Aroni from Vile Cornell Medical in New York City. Naveed, just set up the trial for us, if you would. Okay, um, Samant 4 is a trial of uh, tazepatide uh, initially uh, for a period of 36 weeks, so everybody got tazepatide, and then after that point, they were randomized to placebo or continued tazepatide for another year. And the, the key question was, how well does tazepatide maintain weight reduction and how in, re in relation to placebo and what happens to weight regain once people come back onto placebo. Uh, it was done in patients uh, living without diabetes, so living with obesity, but without diabetes. And one of the key things we really want to know is what is the longer term effects of tazepatide? And also, as I say, what happens in the natural course of disease when you stop tazepatide after a period of, say, a year or so? So that was the kind of key rationale. It was kind of weight maintenance trial, as it were. And how many in the trial? So originally there was just around about 750 or so in the trial originally, and then some of those, the vast majority of those patients continued to the randomised trial phase, um, uh, and I, I, I think roughly about 670 continued to that stage. So a reasonably sizable trial on which to base good results and understand about weight maintenance really. So Lou, take us through the results. So this trial was set up to see if uh, obesity is like every other chronic disease, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. When patients stop medicines and they have those diseases, we expect that the condition will recur. Glucose will go up, lipids go up, blood pressure goes up. And what we found supports that hypothesis, that if you don't continue treatment for obesity, the problem will recur. So what we saw was about a 20% weight loss over the first 36 weeks of the trial, which was open label. Everyone we know got the medication. And then in the placebo control part, there was significant weight regain over the 52 weeks of the control period. And there was continued gradual weight loss over that 52 uh, weeks with uh, continued treatment with a maximum tolerated dose of terzepatide, either 10 or 15 milligrams. Now, what does this mean for the regular uh, diabetologist out there? I think that this goes beyond just diabetes. This goes into obesity. These patients did not have diabetes. I think that it brings obesity into the realm of chronic disease. One of the problems we have to deal with in talking about obesity is that people think of these medicines as giving someone a kickstart. We'll just get him to lose the, the initial weight and then let him go off and do it. And I would say that that's as preposterous as saying we're going to do the same thing with treating somebody with diabetes with insulin. Okay, just get their glucose down to normal and then stop the insulin. Their glucose is going to go back up again. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, that's a very good point. Um, in terms of diabetes, you know, diabetes is the disease most closely linked to excess weight and excess ectopic fat. And clearly, we already know that helping people lose considerable weight can help substantially improve their sugar control. In fact, the previous set of trials with this drug and the surpass trials has already shown substantial improvement in sugar levels, to, you know, to levels, to degrees of reduction, which we haven't really seen with previous drugs. Um, and that's been very encouraging. But who makes a very good point that um, there's a mindset problem that people think, well, you, this is a kickstart, get the drug, lose the weight, and then stop the drug. But actually, what generally this trial shows is that weight will regain. Now, having or said the weight, or just now, obviously, over the course of one year, the weight regain was consistent. But even by the end of one uh, one year off the drug, 
the patients are still around about 9% lower weight than they were at baseline. So that's encouraging. So they have a lower aggregated exposure to excess weight, even if we stop the drug at 36 weeks by the end of 88 weeks. Now, what we don't know and what regulators don't know is what does that mean in terms of outcomes? But patients don't want to put, lose weight, stabilize and then put it back on again, I would suggest to you. And what we also don't know is that what happens to the risk factors, some of the risk factors do rebound once you start putting weight back on again. And what that means for long-term outcomes, we don't really know. So if we could afford it, and if patients are willing, and if the safety data look good long-term, we would probably want to keep the patients on the drugs for a long term to maintain that weight loss. But I'd be interested to hear what Lou, Lou thinks about that. Well, well, one of the interesting things about the trial is that not all of the weight was regained. About half the weight was regained over a one-year period of time without medication. Uh, I mean, that's not kind of what I expected. I thought all the weight would be regained. So it sets up the possibility for other ways of addressing obesity. Maybe intermittent treatment would be acceptable. Treating people every other month or other uh, modalities that could uh, create maintenance but not medicine every single week. And these are important issues because these medicines are expensive and there are issues about taking them every week for the rest of your life. People think, wow, I'm 27 years old. Am I going to take this every week for the rest of my life? So having more flexibility in dosing in the long term may be a big advantage for utilizing these long term. Yeah, no, I would agree. And um, I think, again, Lou makes an excellent point is that with these results and the previous results, there are many options going forward and how we potentially use these drugs. Perhaps we g give people short bursts and help them then change their lifestyles to sustain that weight loss for as long as possible. And once the weight starts to come back up to a certain point, we give the drugs again. So they get another period of... So I, we, the, the multiple options are now in play um, going forward in a way to try and maximize the benefits of the patients, but also um, get the best benefit for society as well. Because it does seem to be a bit of a thing going on. Well, we'll just get, throw you some tazepatide and then you can go away and that'll be job done. And actually, these patients need a lot of support with diet, with lifestyle. With, In, in other words, the drug alone is not enough. No, sir. It's, I, I don't want to say that, so everyone agrees that uh, the foundation of treating obesity is improving diet, improving lifestyle. And, but, but now we're seeing a shift in the type of advice we're giving people. Instead of focusing on counting calories, we're changing to diet quality. You know, what, what are the healthiest foods for someone to eat rather than how many calories did you consume? So that the medicines, the new generation of medicines, reduce calorie intake enough to achieve the weight loss. So we can focus now on what's the healthiest thing for yeah. someone to be eating and let them mentally concentrate on that rather than on how many calories they consumed. And I think that's, uh, we should probably, you know, and a point to that, Lou's completely correct. And we should, we should also potentially now think about asking them to make those changes once they reach a substantial, you know, degree of weight loss or getting towards the plateauing of weight loss is then they are perhaps more likely to be trusting of us, motivated to change their diet quality and perhaps also to start to increase physical activity in a sustainable manner. Because clearly, if you're, if you're carrying, say, 20 kilograms less, your capacity to be physically active and enjoy physical activity is that much greater as well. Right. So we, we, we've almost got to think outside the box of how we combine these drugs with lifestyle and what periods and how we do that. It's, it's, it's so open it's, to different it's a opportunities. Package, really. yes. It's not yeah. just a lobular drug. Yeah. Our, our dietitians, uh, we, we use these medicines regularly in the United States, and our dietitians have never been more satisfied with the advice they're giving because people can comply. What these medicines do is help people to comply with the dietary advice that we're giving. And they feel better, they feel more activated, their mood is better, uh, their quality of life has improved substantially 
through the use of it. But again, I want to emphasize, I'm not suggesting it's the medicine alone. It's that when hunger is gone, when the cravings are reduced, people are able to comply. They, many people know what you're going to tell them. They know, you know, I, I know just what you're going to say, but I can't do it. Now they're able to do it. I've got two questions to ask you. One is, is this the end of bariatric surgery? Uh, I, I do not. Um, that's a very good question. I, I don't think it necessarily is. There are still individuals who would choose, but not very many. But, um, but there, are still, there are some non-responders, aren't there? Uh, um, yes, I mean, I probably don't know that data as well as Lou. I mean, Lou, Lou what's your perspective on that? I don't. Well, one thing I'll note is that in the United States, it's cheaper to have bariatric yeah, surgery it is, yes. than it is to take these yes. medications, which are often not covered. And there is data with bariatric surgery that there's a long-term mortality benefit, cancer benefit, and other benefits that we, we just don't have the data. So yeah. some people uh, see in the United States that there may be an increase in bariatric surgery because insurers and employers may start to cover that rather than then cover these expensive medications. Interesting. And that same thing happened with statins and PCSK9. When there was more expensive lipid-loading drugs, people went the extra mile to make sure that patients were genuinely intolerant to statins before they thought, and many more patients were probably able to prescribe statins. So same thing happens. Okay, next question is, we've seen a lot of shortages with semaglutide, Zepidide, are we going to see the same things? Is that going to be an issue? And is that going to drive some of the prescribing habits? You know, we haven't got enough to do people to take it forever, so we're going to have to put people on it at intervals because we haven't got enough to go around. I'll start then. I'll let Lou give the much more mature answer. It's certainly driving regulators, for example, in the UK, to say that you can only have, for example, it's only licensed semaglutide for two years. Yeah. Um, and it's because of, you know, A, probably the cost to the NHS system in the UK. Um, but equally, the shortages have also made us think about how we're going to prescribe these drugs. I mean, hopefully the companies will have, they're trying to make more manufacturing plants, but the number of people who would, would potentially benefit from these drugs, at least with the data we have so far, is substantial. So there's going to be a great demand, and I think we do need to think outside of the box of how we can use these drugs more cleverly to reach more patients uh, and combined with lifestyle. But let Lou pick that up as well. I, I agree. There are so many people who need this, and so few are actually being treated. We have evidence that even before these medications, only 2%, 2% of the people who qualified for treatment of their obesity with medication were being treated in the United States. And now it's increased to 3%. So there's enormous demand. If you look at other chronic disease fields, let's look at hypertension. There are over 100 drugs in 10 therapeutic categories. I envision that we're going to need many more drugs, not just two. And they're going to be subcategorized. Some will be better for patients with a normal glucose and a fatty liver. Those may have a greater glucagon effect. And others, no. If their glucose is high, but they don't have a fatty liver, maybe they need something like the GLP-1, GIP combinations. So I think we're beginning to move into what I'll call the golden age of anti-obesity therapies, where many compounds will be developed, many manufacturers will be making them, and we will be treating people the same way we treat diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. And, 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 on that base, and hopefully with more competition, the costs will come, come down. down. Mm -hmm. I know there are over 70 drugs in development at the moment. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's a, we were saying this a bit earlier, that it's a bit like a Swiss army knife. If semaglutide is the Swiss army knife with a single blade, then you've got you know, the ones coming up that have the, 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 the scissors, the six knives, the, yes. you know, all the extra bells and whistles. Well, we've known for a long time that obesity is treatable. I went back and found the first paper where I talked about the modern medical management of obesity from 1998. We've known that it's treatable, but it has been very difficult to figure out how to overcome the barriers, the resistance mechanisms of the very clever weight regulating system. But now that we've broken through and we've seen the incredible impact that these drugs can have 
have on someone's life and health. I think, like you said, 70 drugs, I'm not sure how many will make it, but I think the future is bright for treating obesity. Yeah, and hopefully we get to a point where we can get to a cost where the benefits substantially outweigh the cost so there's actual benefit to society and to individuals and and clearly part of that is the ongoing huge range of ongoing trials where we establish the benefits in a holistic manner but also make sure that the safety is there as well because that's really important do you know what else it does it just strikes me that it performs one really important psychological impact for regulators and policymakers it shows that unless you can help people by taking away those, uh, you know, those hunger signals, they can't do, they can't just stop eating and exercise more, which is always their mantra. And perhaps it'll show that obesity is a medical problem, not just a, a problem of willpower. I think that this has proven it to people in a very large way. I mean, we could have lectured about this for the next 50 years and it could not come close to replicating the change in attitude uh, that we're seeing because the people who are taking these have become proselytizers for them. I, I read an editorial in a, in a major American newspaper written by someone who was against medication and now is very much for it because he took it. And he said, for years I've been struggling with my weight and I realize now that there was something physical going on. It's not that I was weak. It's that I, I couldn't control it. And I think that we're going to see more and more people um, come to that side and recognize that this is a serious medical problem and that it is physically based. I, and I should finish on just to give, he's, he's completely correct. There was a recent paper from colleagues in Oxford that said willpower is often not enough. Having said all that, we still do need to place more emphasis on prevention. We are getting better at helping people make prescriptive lifestyle changes. So it's a combination of both prevention, changing the physical and food environment, and also these you know, uh, newer tools like these drugs will help change the obesogenic environment and, and, and improve the health of all of our nations, hopefully. Well, thank you both very much. Fascinating times and, as Lou said, a real golden age. We'll be back very soon. Bye for now.